Hello, and welcome to our chapter on databases. We're going to learn a lot in this chapter, uh, learn a whole new programming language, SQL, and learn how to use that. So you're going to need a new piece of software to run all of the exercises that I'm going to do uh, called SQLite Browser. We're using a database called SQLite. Go ahead and download this. You might have to pause and come back if you like. Go to sqlitebrowser.org and download it and install it. Um, while you're doing that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history. So, in the old days, 1960s, 1970s, I started doing computing in uh, 1975, um, we didn't have a lot of storage. I mean, this is, you know, 16 gigabytes right here, and, you know, we didn't even have megabytes. I mean, uh, the computer I had had a few megabytes of stuff. So, it well, so we didn't have a lot of disk drives, and so permanent storage uh, was often sequential. And these tapes, these tape drives that we had, uh, tapes and tape drives were the scalable part of storage because you could just make more tapes and you could rack them up. And so that was our way of greatly increasing the storage of the computer. The problem they had was is they were sequential. You read it, it advances, read it, it advances, read and advance. Now, interestingly, we've been writing programs that do this, that everything we've written so far pretty much reads the whole file reads the whole web page, reads this, everything we read it, we read it either a loop or read the whole thing. And that's because we have plenty of memory, but we're still reading sequentially. And, um, and so the way you would do this when you didn't have enough spinning storage or online storage is you'd use offline storage, but the trick would be that you would sort it. So let's imagine that you're a bank and you have a bunch of accounts, only a few of which are active on any day, and you have a tape that has in account number order from low to high, the, the prior balance, last night's balance of every one of your bank accounts, and then you do all the transactions and you record how much money was taken in or out for each account number, and then you sort those transactions. And then what you do is what we call a sequential master update, and that is you would write a program <clears throat> that would read the first transaction and hold on to it. Say, okay, this is account 45. Then it would read the first account, like one, and it would copy one, and then it read two, and read like seven, eight, 42, 43, then we'd read like 44, and then we'd read 45, but it would now it would change that and write the new 45 and read the next thing. And so this might be 60. And it would read a bunch of stuff and copy a bunch of stuff. And then it would finally get to 60 and it would merge the add or subtract. And so the, the old balance ended up here and the new balance did here. And you had to only make one pass through the data. So it was super efficient. So we had all these mechanisms to sort. We used to do punch cards and have sorters and all these things. And then those things would run for hours. And if you watch old TV shows, these tapes are spinning and these things are running back and forth. These are simply reading and writing tapes. Um, and that's how we did a lot of data processing because we could store far more on a tape drive than we could on a disk. And with a racks of tape drives, we could scale the storage that our computers had. And so that's the way we did data processing, but it meant that you the only way you knew what the old balance was, was it was the balance as of this morning before your bank started. You don't know what the balance was for the day. And that led to things like you can never retreat, uh, return, uh, you can never withdraw more than $100 a day or something like that because you, you don't know what the old balance was. Or you might go withdraw $100 at a couple of different branches. And, and so they, they didn't, they weren't able to look your stuff up right away. Now, it didn't take long until the disk drives got better and better and better, and you could store the entire accounts, all the accounts and their current balances, on computers. And then the, the problem becomes is what happens if sort of in the middle of the afternoon you want to update a balance? Well, do you want to read all your data and then write a brand new one? And that's, say that takes like 10 minutes. That means for that 10 minutes, only one person can be updating their bank balance. And so because we could randomly access this data. We didn't have to read it all sequentially. The trick was is how do you spread the data out and then how do you make it so you can change a balance? This is of course second nature today, but how do you make it so you change the balance here without changing the balance there and you can have multiple people going simultaneously to these things and make sure that you can't say to withdraw money at two different locations simultaneously and somehow have your bank balance get corrupted by that. So there's a lot of debate on how to do that. And in early days, we just did sequential master update. But increasingly, we wanted to make better use of the random nature of our computers and, and our storage. And so that's what led to databases. Databases are the science of how you make use of 
rotating random access data, permanent data, in a way that allows you to read, modify, and update that simultaneously from many different locations and yet keep the data completely consistent. And so this led to a study of a thing called relational databases. And there's, relational databases are not the only databases um, that, that happened. We had many other kinds of databases, and there was a debate. And I remember in the 70s and the 80s, there was a folks that says, oh, no, no, there you can do index sequential. That's the way to do it. And relational databases weren't popular, weren't all that popular the uh, first time that, uh, that I saw them. I, I didn't like relational databases. But relational databases had an inherent advantage because they were based on some really powerful mathematics. And the interesting thing is, is early on, the relational databases were slower but eventually they figured out how to sort of bring all the cleverness to bear to make relational databases fast. And so relational databases are a pretty advanced technology and there are companies like Oracle that are very, very wealthy and their primary product for many, many years was nothing more than a clever database product, a clever piece of software that was really good at solving this problem. And that's how important this problem was to computing. If you read about databases, you're going to see two sets of terminology. One set of terminology comes from the mathematical background and um, has to do with the underlying math. Things like relations, tuples, and attributes. That's kind of like the fancy math version of it. And uh, programmers kind of think of them as rows and columns inside of a table. And so if you look at sort of fancy theory, you'll see words that look like this. And they're just full of this and the connection. Now, all this is important and true, and if you really want to get good, you sort of begin to understand the nature that we model data at connections rather than uh, at sort of intersection points rather than just modeling data as a, as a flat file the way we do. But for now, we're, we're going to, as programmers, think of this as just like, oh, it's like a super fast spreadsheet. The super fast part is the math. For us, the rows, columns, and tables are spreadsheets. So it thinks of Think in a spreadsheet of sheets, sheet, 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 and that's like a table, a named thing like tracks or albums, artists or genres. And then there is rows, and each row has a different kind of data. And then there's columns, and we sort of specialize the first column in many spreadsheets to say what's in there. This is not really the data, this is like metadata. It's like the titles in this first column. That's not really the data, and the data starts here. And we have different kinds of data like strings and numbers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for each of the rows. And literally, you can get away with this as sort of about 80% of databases is just a really super cool spreadsheet. But under the covers, it is far more powerful than that. So one of the early arguments that uh, happened was, again, what the programming model for this was. And a lot of folks wanted a programming model that reflected how the data was actually stored. Um, the notion of structured query language came about in a way to express what you wanted to happen and allow that to be sort of a very abstract expression. Select all records that meet this criteria, not read, 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 read. And so structured query language is a uh, not a procedural language. It is a it is a imperative language where you're simply saying what you want and then somebody writes the loop, the database actually does the loop, but it's a, a way for you to avoid actually writing the loop. Now that turns out to be the power of databases because the cleverness in how to write the loop is a way that you would probably never figure out how to be most super, supremely optimal when it comes to writing the, writing the loop. As you'll see toward the end of joining many tables together and selecting and throwing array and getting down a count or whatever, someone has figured out how to do that really, really well. So the idea was, is you would express, you know, we're going to create some data, we're going to retrieve some data, we're going to insert and delete it. Create, read, crud, C-R-U-D. Um, <clears throat> create, read, update, and delete, crud. And so that's what this does. It's a, a language that does this very simply. Now, the applications that we're going to use um, this for are more of a data analysis application. We've been doing data analysis for, through the whole course. And the kinds of things that we'll see in the remaining chapters is we'll take some raw data file. These might actually come across the network and we'll write some Python programs to play with that data, parse it, clean it up, make sense of it, you know, and then write it into a database. And this might be a slow processor, this might be really nasty, and this might be a way to have very clean data. And then we'll write another Python program to sort of read this, read through it, and it's all efficient and pretty. And then we can produce files and maybe we'll visualize it or do work further analysis in R, Excel, or, 
or a JavaScript uh, visualization framework. And so in this situation, you will be the person who is both sort of writing the programs, database administrator, and you can, using SQLite Browser, play and look at the database kind of in a raw way. And the first part of this, we are mostly going to be using SQLite Browser just to talk straight to a database. Later, we'll write Python programs that read and write data and, and visualize the data. So, so this is what we're gonna do first. And then second, we're gonna do this part right here. That's the second thing we're gonna do. Now, another really common use of applications and something that if you continue uh, learning more about programming is that you will want to write a, uh, an online application like uh, Amazon or a company or, a, or Twitter that's got a website and it stores dynamic data in databases. And so the picture for that is similar but different than the picture we're gonna start out with. And so the way this usually works is that you, the end user, uses a web browser, talks to the application, and the developer writes the application software, and that application software stores its data in a database, and inside that database, we talk to the database using SQL, and all the data is actually stored here, and the magic happens, the data server is that database software that's so precious and valuable. And then there's another person, often called the database administrator, who has access to the direct access to the data. And these roles in medium and large project are kept separate, mostly because the, mostly because the, um, the production, while it's running and live, the developer leaves the data alone and works on, say, the next version of the software. Um, and then the developer has a test version of the application that they run on their computer uh, where they're doing all that stuff. And so this database administrator is a, is a role in a large project where we have to run production and, and keep production careful, uh, keep, keep production in good shape. So the database administrator has this responsibility for the production aspects of the data. And you may be working in a situation where that you're not actually controlling the data. The database server is on different computers. You have little special access and you write programs to sort of read the data. Um, and so the database administrator is the person who is asked by the organization to administer that data. The data that we develop, and we'll do this in the second part of these lectures, um, conforms to a data model. That's the metadata. Is this an integer? Is this a string? You know, how many columns is this? And the data model turns out to be very, very important. And there's a lot of science to building an effective data model that leads to really good performance. And it's a, it's a collaborative activity between the, the application developers and the uh, database administrator to make it so it's efficient, runs in production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of products out there that you may encounter. We're going to be using SQLite. SQLite's a little tiny database server, and it's built into so many things, and that's why we like it. But if you're going to work at a large organization, you could easily run into Oracle, which is the number one commercial uh, product. Uh, Microsoft has a thing called SQL Server, which is a commercial product, and it's also very popular and very effective. Uh, the more popular open source, uh, there's things called Postgres. There's MySQL, and MySQL recently was sort of bought by Oracle. And there is a, a copy of that called MariahDB that doesn't belong to Oracle, MariahDB. Um, and so you uh, most of the SQL that we're going to learn is common across these database because uh, database systems because SQL is a standard. But then there are parts that weren't part of the original standard where each data, database vendor has done things a little bit different. But there is a core common subset that do, does the basic create, read, update, and delete operations. So SQLite is a very popular, you probably have it in your cell phone 10, 12 times, your web browser has a database engine in it, your car has a few databases in it. Um, and so SQLite is what's called an embedded database system. Um, Python comes built in with, with it, you just import SQLite 3 and away you go. And uh, so it's a very, very popular because it's free, it's open source, and it is such a tiny little piece of software that you just include it in other pieces of software and use it to solve the data management problems of those pieces of software. Like your browser might use SQLite to store your bookmarks. Now you think, oh, there's only how many bookmarks can you have? But what if there you need it to be fast? And what if there's like people that have 10,000 bookmarks? There probably are. Do you still want it fast? Do you want to be able to search? And so you get all that by using a database like SQLite. And so again, we're going to encourage you to download the SQLite browser so you can follow along with what we're going to do coming up next. 
And so here is the SQLite browser. Here's what it looks like. And it's just a desktop application. And uh, coming up next, we'll start playing with this desktop application and see how it works.